yes, yes, and we are back. We are back. You are tuned in to the Last Mile Radio right here on Serious XM. Kev is about to go down. I'm super excited, man. The guest we have today, man, is somebody I actually hold near and dear to my heart, bro. So serious, so serious. And who we have today is the one and only Dr. Juan Carlos <laughs> is going down. Dr. Juan Carlos, pleasure to have you in the building with us today, man. So appreciate y'all having me down here. It's excited. And as you know, E, I'm always going to back you up 100. Whatever you need, I'm appreciate here it. for you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Kev, yeah, I, I got to say, me, me and Juan Carlos, we actually work together at, at a school. It's the most of. Shout out to Branson School, by the way. Shout, Shout out, out to Branson. Branson. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Where is Branson? So Branson is in Moran, California, in Ross specifically. Ross. In yeah. Moran County, though. In Moran yes. County. Super uh, super nice place. Super nice place. It's a bit of a bubble, and I'm fortunate enough to go there to kind of pop that bubble a little bit. There we go. There we go. Well, I live there, so I do know the bubble of Marin very well. <laughs> there we go. Yes. My, my kid goes to a public school, but I, I, do know, uh, I, knew, I do know Branson. So it was a little bit of a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely we're definitely excited to get into it man and um one thing I, I think is important to start i think is really important to capture your journey you know what i mean how do we get here what do you do how did you begin to do what it is that you do all that good stuff so can you please like share with us your journey man like what led to your work in promoting like dei and things of that nature wow wow well, then, you know, we're going to have to do segment three and four, but we'll, <laughs> we'll do the short part. So I got to give a shout out first to, you know, none other than Tupac that talks about roses out of concrete. Mm. Right. And so much we talk about really, you know, who are you? What do you have? What are your outcomes? But we don't understand the conditions in which you come from. Right. And I think that's what we forget too often. And so for me, you know, when people think about, you know, who I am and, you know, they, they come up with whatever they, they want to. But I'm always clear, like. There's this line that I always say, you can't tell me what I am, but I'll tell you who I am. You can't define mm -hmm. me by my hair, my skin color, or what I wear, right? I belong to no one country, but all the world belongs to me. So I was born in Brazil uh, as a child, uh, moved around to six different countries and states by the time I was 19. Uh, my parents were from Nicaragua. They were born there. And so it's just an immigrant story of how to be around and everything. And so I think what, what I'm clear about this word of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion is um, I'm a product of just my condition, right, of low expectations from institutions, hmm. right? Couldn't read and write by the time I was 19. But what I did know was that I had a perseverance attitude that my family gave me, right? Because they immigrated. They were like, okay, we're going to just pass the struggle no matter what. And then the um, first book I ever did learn how to read was by our brother Malcolm X. And so his autobiography, right, that yeah. was like the thing for me. I was like, wait a minute, it ain't just me. Right. You know, it ain't just me. There's all these other people. And so that got me down the path of wanting to be passionate about the educational system and become a teacher, taught for many years in, in Florida, and then came out to California to do my doctorate work. And that's when the really the, everything blew wide open when I was like, wow. Hold on a second. <clears throat> you couldn't read or write at what age? Age 19. And you are now? Dr. Juan Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> that story in, in and of itself could be an entire episode. Right. I mean, that is that is amazing. Yeah. And I, I want to say that the autobiography of Malcolm X should be required reading for every high school. Sweat of God. Right. So right? serious. It, it changed my life when I read it. I had a whole new perspective. Same. You know, because a lot of people, especially, you know, when you come, when you live in like a middle class white community, the idea of Malcolm X was that he was this, you know, super hardcore militant. Yes, right. But, yes. But when you see him turn the corner to understand what humanity really could be. Yes. Right. And, and of course, he was his last life was cut short, but that should be required reading. I Ooh. agree. Yeah. I mean, multiple changes in his life. Multiple. You know, and a lot of what we're doing reflects what he was doing way long ago. Facts. Yes. Yeah. It's about us growing to be the better version of our higher selves. That's that's what we're gained and really primed to do, but we create these conditions that really, you know, shut us down in that way. I mean, I always like to say, there's another spoken word I have is like 1600. It's only half, you know, my SAT score was 790. Mm. That's only half of 1600. You know, my they give you 200 points just for your name. You yeah. Know? So that's you right. know they spell my name wrong. <laughs> Man. Oh, that's another thing. Definitely got to touch up on that. My boy definitely is a fire poet as well. A doctor, a teacher, and, and a poet. I forgot about that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Dropping the jewels. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So, you know, we talk about 
DEI a lot, yeah. and we do at the last mile as well. I mean, I think there's a an equity problem as a whole, not just across the country, but especially when we talk about the system. Yeah. And, you know, who we're incarcerating, why we're incarcerating them, you know. And one of the things that I contend is if you put the kind of policing you had in marginalized communities into Pacific Heights in San Francisco, you'd have the same amount of bus. Facts. Mm. I mean, we got kids walking into prep schools that are probably carrying Molly. Right. Mm-hmm. In the class one substance. Facts. Right. Probably carrying cocaine. Facts. Right. Definitely possible. So, I mean, how do we kind of pivot this narrative and pivot this idea of DEI so that we can start applying it to the system? Well, definitely we need to be doing exactly what we're doing right now, which is having more dialogue about it, right? Uh, and, And what that means is let's start just exposing some basic facts and repeating those basic facts, right? First and foremost, let's let's think about us as human beings. And the fact that we are more than our mistakes. We don't ever want to be judged from our last mistakes. If we did only that, we would never get there. So I think the the first facts that I think are so important is why are we investing nearly three times as much money in our prisons than our educational system? Hmm. We got to keep repeating that over and over and over again. Come on, man. Here's another recent fact. Why are we... You know, on average, 25, 250, 250 preschool students get suspended every day. Preschool? What? Preschool. I was unaware of that. So why are we suspending preschool students? So we're already criminalizing the behavior of a child. Wow. Right? And so there are so many ways to address these pieces, but first is just awareness, dialogue, and then, you know, there's so many amazing human beings who are doing great work to address this, but we don't lift their voices up. We don't have this platform to share about that all the time. But I think, you know, sharing some facts some basic facts. Why do we why do we do that? Why, why are we spending more money on prisons than on, on people? Why are we not investing in the humanity of people as opposed to criminalizing the behavior of people? Right. That's yeah. deep. That's that deep. is deep. And, and man, I, I I just can't I just can't steamroll over over that preschool thing, man. That is nuts. Because what that does to the conditioning, right? Like you said, it, it's now criminalizing that early on. I'm gonna be honest. I I was a bad student. Just being straight up, go. I was a bad student. I was a bad kid. But I definitely recall getting in trouble as early as preschool. And I remember what that did for me. How it normalized getting in trouble in in certain things, and it ultimately like desensitized me to caring about trouble mm. from yes. it happening that early on based on that approach. So, like, hearing how common that is now, because I, I thought that was rare. I thought, like, I was just, like, this <laughs> devil child, right? Like, man, I'm tripping. But to hear how common that is now, that's just mind-blowing because I do understand more than I ever have how that ultimately conditioned me. And mind you, I went to prison at the age of 17 in high school, in school. So, like, it, it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. I wasn't just born that way. Like, it was a time period of development to get there. You know what I mean? And now reflecting on that... I can definitely see that parallel there. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I could definitely see where where that where that line of, of caring was lost, where that became detached. But sure, and I I believe that could definitely well have played a role in that. So that's just that just messed me up right there. That was crazy. That's well, nuts. I think too the the equity in DEI is something that's really missed. So mm. we you know we talk a lot about how we can have more diverse workplaces and we can have more diverse schools and we have mm. more diverse this or that. But the fact of the matter is, unless it's coupled with equity and we have mm. the same money going into schools, yes. right, we're going to come out with the same results over and over again. Right. Yes. You know, and the number that I actually key into all the time is California. Okay. $136,000 a year to imprison somebody in the state of California now. <sighs> Crazy. I mean, plus, right? Right. And, and who knows what it's going to be next year? You know, as the property values go up, the cost of living goes up, the amount of money that the CDCR is paying to contractors goes up, it's going to just continue to grow. And Can you imagine if we took all of those people that shouldn't be there at this point, that have either aged out or have, you know, basically more than paid their debt to society and just gave them $136,000 on the yes. street, yes. what they would do for their communities? Yes. I mean, studies show that if you give somebody a job that pays them over sixty k a year, they're not going back to prison. Oh, I could definitely mm. see that. They're not. Could definitely There's no that. reason to. Yes. And so when we talk about equity, we are spending all this money to incarcerate people across the country. California is as liberal as it is, is one of the most punitive states in the nation, with one of the highest prison populations in the nation. The women's population is growing. Man. 
It's insane. Yes. And then we look at schools and, you know, the school, at, you know, I say my daughter goes to a public school, but come on, she goes to Mount Tam High in Marin County. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like one of the best schools in, in the state. They have CNC routers where they're training people to be engineers and you know what I mean? And they've got the AVID program in the morning and they've got, you know, you can take a, an eighth period if you want to and do more. Wow. Yes. You know, she she got one B last semester and decided to take AP classes next year because she doesn't want to be below a 4.0. And they support that. Yes. Her counselor called me and was like, hey, can she do this? That's the kind of engagement we need in all of our schools exactly. and all of our communities. And if we diverted that money that you're talking about, what could we do? I mean, we could have an amazing system. I agree. So we know money is a key piece for sure. So so I, I'm glad you brought that up because 136 compared to the 15,000 on average that they're they're giving per student per pupil. Right. You know, you're investing in the wrong here. thing, right? <laughs> so that's the obvious. I think the other piece that I, I, I'll just add to that though is the space of just little by little. Again, starting from preschool and then going all the way to grade school, elementary school, middle school, high school. E, just think about your journey of just like how you were. What, what kind of attention you were given, right, from a space of like, oh, we're going to give you attention for all this, quote, bad behavior you're doing. Right. Right. So now you're being smaller, put in a box. And one of the things that I learned as a teacher was first students rise to the teacher's lowest expectations. Hmm. Right. Not necessarily mm. the highest expectations, but to their lowest expectations. So thinking about over time, if you knew that you were always going to fail, why would you try? Right. Mm. Flip side on that, because we're talking about Branson, you know, an elite independent school. Right. If you knew that you couldn't fail because of the pressures that you couldn't fit outside the box, why would you try? So now what we've created is a whole educational system about everybody just fitting a certain kind of box. And then that box goes back to because you brought up, you know, Tam. We're actually, E and I and, 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 and Brother Antoine doing Shout some out work. Banks, Antoine Banks yep. Williams. <laughs> that, that it works with the dollars that are there, and yet we still have racial disparities. Right. So oh, if you're black sure. and brown, those students, while all those opportunities are there, are still being called the N-word, yep. right? Are still being addressed. And what's great is I've got to give a shout out to the leadership, and specifically uh, Tara Tapia, the superintendent, white female, who's taking this on, mm -hmm. right? And it takes that space where all of a sudden what we start seeing is it, this is not a black and brown problem. This is not just a white problem. This is a human being problem. Right. right. And how do we create that, like you said, equity, looking at the disparities, diversity, bring the different, but then inclusion. Let's not forget inclusion. Let's not forget right. that belonging. We all want to belong as human beings. Right. Well, and it's been shown, I mean, for almost any societal issue. And for me, I'm 25 years clean and sober, right? So for me, having community, having somewhere where I could go and be myself mm -hmm. made all the difference in the world. You know, and people find it in different ways, whether it's church or 12 step or, you know, they find a good support group within their neighborhood, whatever. But that one kind of thread that binds us is community. Yes. And Definitely. being able to have conversations. You know, I often say, and you've heard me say this, this is not a red and blue issue. No. It's 100% a human rights issue. Yes. Definitely. We've got buy-in from one of the reddest governors in the country for the last mile in Governor Holcomb in Indiana, mm -hmm. and from one of the bluest in Governor Newsom in California, because they recognize that this is a human condition. Yes. That it's not about what your political beliefs are, that it's not about your, I mean, it is about, unfortunately, your 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 social status and your, your, your wealth. <laughs> yes. But they recognize that it doesn't need to be a political issue. Right. It's a people issue, for yep. sure. So I love, I love that. I love that. I mean, inclusion is, it's everything. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think I think that's one of the reasons why I think we kind of see the response that we see when it comes to certain aspects of crime, because you begin to internalize that lack of inclusion. So it, it, it in my opinion, creates a sense of rebellion. You know what I mean? Like when you don't fit in and you the misfit, I think it's real easy to be like, well, fuck you. I'm going to do my own thing. You there know you what go. I mean? So, like, I, I think that that sense of inclusion definitely is needed if we want to see actual healing if we want to see actual unity you know what i mean i mean inclusion and unity go hand in hand right Absolutely. <laughs> for sure so i definitely agree with that, that that's powerful man that's powerful but i, I want to uh, pivot just a little bit just a little bit right i want to talk trauma i want to talk okay. trauma because i know that's something that you definitely are aware of and have an understanding of better than a lot of other people right mm. better than most people should i say for sure for sure so like i want to know 
what role does trauma play in criminal justice, in the criminal justice system, and how can that be better addressed? Speaking of ways of like how we can better address things. Mm. Boy, I got to give a shout out here to uh, former incarcerated uh, gentleman Jeff Wallace, who, who quote says, don't ask me, you know, what you do that for? As opposed to ask them what happened, hmm. right? And and so I think when we think about trauma in the, the criminal justice system is that, again, these little bits of pieces that people don't understand and appreciate that if somebody did commit a crime or just had a, 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 a judgment call, whatever whatever the call is, it's a human being first, right? And there's something that led to that. Right. But we don't have a system that says, okay, we're going to focus on what led to that. We have a system that focuses only on the behavior of that. And then at that, it's a punitive system, right? Right, Not a restorative system, right? Even even at San Quentin, right? You know, like, you know, e, I've been going out there for now 20 years playing ball, right? Right. And it's phenomenal, like, you know, as, as what we're – but even that, that's just a moment in time that, that we're able to just have some fellowship, humanize each other and all of that. Uh, but – we also know it's the only restorative, or, or what, what do they call it now, San Quentin? They don't the call rehabilitation it rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is the only one in the whole state. Right. Like, like we're not thinking about that for everybody, right? So I think that's the piece about trauma is that we don't think about what led to this as opposed to, you know, just focusing on the behavior of this. Right. And so I think about could we just not, I think, any anytime somebody crosses that line, whatever it is, I'm, you know, I'm not here to say what's legal, what's not legal, but whatever, whatever the crime is, we should always start with, did you take the ACE test, which is the- Oh, what's the ACE test? Break it down. Yep. Break it down. So the ACE test, right, uh, is this test that talks about all the potential traumas in your life. And and they've gotten so, uh, so much more research now that there's personal trauma that you could have had, like if you were abused physically, sexually, right, if there were drugs in your house, violence in your house, all those pieces. So you have to go through those pieces. And then there's also environmental trauma that you go through, the community that you're in. Right. Then there's things like, you know, just, just literally the societal, like climate trauma. Like you're talking about like the tornadoes that rip through Oklahoma. Like that, that's going right. to change somebody. Definitely. You definitely. know, you lose your home like that. Hurricanes. Hurricanes all that, and all that. So I think like, could we just not do step one and just take the ACE test and so that. I bet you if we all took it right now, we probably would score 100. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Right? Well, well, and then you get into a system that re-traumatizes you. Ooh, right. Come facts. on, man. Come on, man. Nah, for real, though. Because, whew, I know, I know entering the system, especially early on, I learned very quickly that this is, in my, in my opinion, from experience, the most dehumanizing and oppressive experience you could face in America today. Yep. Period. <clears throat> I think anybody that's been strip searched by another man that will part. tell you exactly how difficult it is. That if part. you're having to do it multiple times a day because you're working, then you get desensitized to it. That's the yeah. to me. That's the coldest part. Yeah. That not not to not to pivot. You know what I mean. But to me, that is absolutely the coldest part. Becoming desensitized to stripping for another man to the point it don't even bother you the same way no more because yeah. it's just so normal. Like they strip you of everything. But that that's going left now. That's going left now. On the real, y'all got me. Y'all <laughs> going, got me going down my trauma. Damn it. <laughs> but but facts around that. I mean, I want to highlight like you know. If people haven't read, right, uh, The Jim Crow by M Michelle Angel, like, Love we got to talk about, like, what what happened from literally from slavery right. to now incarceration, right? But then I always want to highlight, like, this educational system, you know, that, that school to prison pipeline piece. Right. It was another tool. Like, we already know that our founding fathers talked about, like, we need to have a two-tier system. Right. right. Okay. Well, we know that was based on race. That was based on class. That was based on gender. We know all those things. So now the question is, why are we continuing to allow our educational systems to have punitive approaches? Why do we continue to desensitize students and adults to thinking that it's OK to suspend people? It's OK to neglect preschool because they're just acting out, you know, and then you start to racialize this even worse than for the males, that little box. I can never have any emotions. I can never feel anything. Right. And as men in the room right now, we're like. Wasn't probably till my 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 first son was born uh, that probably the tears came down my eyes for the first time, mm -hmm. right? That, like the fact that we're not allowed to feel, right? I mean, I think these are the pieces that the educational system only complicates and allows in this criminal justice system to exist the way it does. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, this heavy. this is all this is all 
right on point. And I think we've missed the the opportunity a lot of times when you're talking about preschoolers, especially to incorporate positive reinforcement versus punishment. Facts. You know, because kids don't react to punishment anyway. No. Well, they I mean, get scared of it. Yeah. They get right. scared and desensitized. And then yep. they decide to do that the same thing with other people. Right. It starts in our home where we use this punitive approach. Right. And, I, you know, I bless my parents. You know, they, they were doing the best that they could. They were doing the best that they could out of love. Right. But then I go to a school system. that Why is the school system doing the same thing? Right. Mm. This, this, this same punitive approach. And then why do we go out into society? And because of this world that we live in, of the current version of capitalism is that, oh, whatever is the most out there, we're going to make the most money. So we, what do we got? We got cancel culture. So there's no space for right. restorativeness. There's no space for that. Yep. And so, we need to make space for it, damn it. And let's talk more about that, your work in restorative justice, because I know that's a cornerstone mm-hmm. of how you help rebuild communities, how you help people come back to communities, how you help children who are suffering mm-hmm. from the effects of trauma at an early age. You know, and we can hear all the stories in the world, but the question is, what are we doing about it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to hear more about what you're doing around restorative justice, because I know that's a cornerstone of how you work. Yes, yes. So uh, I, I got to give out some shout outs to these other organizations that, you know, have led me down this path that also are doing this work in school so that, again, when people hear this, they're like, OK, we're hearing a lot of solutions out there. We just don't get to hear them all often. Right. So I think about first and foremost, I'll never forget my Shifu, Master Andre Salvage, right? Kung Fu Master. Went with them for eight years. First, first person who ever taught me two things. One how to kill someone with my bare hands. Damn. <laughs> well, when you learn that, you're like, well, you know what? I don't know if I really would ever want to get angry. Right. <laughs> because really, yeah. you know, you know what you, you're, you're capable of. Right. Which is very different than you grow up, like we know, right, in the streets where you just, okay, I'm just going to pop off, and I never understand the impact that it has on somebody. Right. So the first part about rest- restoration is understanding that we're human beings. Like, whoa, the power of what my hands can do, mm-hmm. right? In that space of restoration is that space of like what I've started to learn that we have this little protocol that 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 E and I and, and banks we work on all the time is like, can you just do this four step piece Four step protocol? Can you just for a moment? What's happening right now in this moment? How am I feeling? Right. And then what's per- my perspective that I'm seeing this from? And then do I have an inquiry? The idea is like, you know how they always say, like, just take a moment to breathe. I remember how people used to just breathe, Juan Carlos. Actually, they call me, you know, JC or Jay or, you know, John or whatever. Just breathe. And I was so angry, you know, so angry. Righteous rage, I'll call it. <laughs> and in that space, be like, well, I, I just breathe. I'm still upset. I'm hella mad at you, you know, for what you did. And what I started to realize is like, what am I doing in that process? So in a breath, literally. What's my lenses? What's my inquiry? Boom. And then the movement changes. So we teach literally from young students to older students to adults. Harder to work with adults. <laughs> but we teach them just take a moment to take that pause and breathe to do that. And then the nonviolent communication comes in where it says when there's an action that has occurred. I mean, even, you know, I'll go back to the time that, that we had a conversation, right, e, where you know, you were like, hey, what's going on? And then I had to come in and apologize. I was like, oh, I heard what happened. And then what you need is, okay, then I apologize for this, right? That's the piece that if you put that as a normative pro- process, you start to change the way the culture is in the right. school community. Yeah. <clears throat> I love that. I mean, that's definitely something that I've been taught in. I go to a somatic trauma therapist. Oh. And so it's constantly watching my heart rate. My mm-hmm. my triggers, my actually my my kind of notifications of my triggers, mm-hmm. where my jaw clenches, where I start to feel like that burn in the back of my neck. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and the idea is that before you get to that, you take the pause. Yes. So the work is finally getting from physical triggers to okay, I'm starting to feel something here. Yes. What is it I'm feeling? And just be able to take that beat. Just just be able to just hold on for one second before that thing comes out of my mouth. That is going to be hard to fix. Right? Yes, and that's one. That was one of my issues. Is I just couldn't help it. <laughs> you know, it was like <laughs> it just come out because I got a bad decision maker up here mm-hmm. that's been taught a lot of really bad things about how things are going to end up. So I'm already like 15 steps ahead of how this confrontation is going to end. When in reality, someone's just asking me how I'm doing. 
Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. How are you? Are you okay? What do you think I'm not? You know? <laughs> it's like, you know, and I love the I love the the comments about kung fu. The the guy that I train with actually tells me all the time, the best defense is to leave the room. Yes. Mm. Look for the exit. Yes. Do not engage. Yes. You can do whatever you need to do because you've been shown how to do that. Yes. But you need to learn how to just walk away. The best fight is the one that you never have to. Exactly. That's that sounds like some Sun Tzu art of war stuff right <laughs> it, there. On the it, it really is. It really. I mean, and, and the thing is, there. Are, what I'm learning is that we have to figure out where, first and foremost, it is not one solution that we provide to, to these educational institutions, and then particularly in our criminal justice system, mm -hmm. but multiple. I mean, I'm thinking right now that, um, you know, we got to bring in uh, Ashanti Banks. If y'all, I mean, no, yeah, Ashanti. No, Branch, Ashanti Branch from the mask you live in. Mm -hmm. This young brother, I mean, he has done so much great work about saying how we live with a mask all the time. Mm. And how do you, you know, learn how to take that off? And we have to have multiple forms, whether it's Kung Fu, somatic healing, take the mask off, the protocol. Because think about educational systems. If we know in preschool we're already suspending children, we already know that we have so many ways that we're criminalizing and desensitizing people to violence. And thinking that, oh, I just need to figure out how to take care of myself. There is no, you know, there is no community. That's just me on my own. Right. Right. Yeah, it's brutal. And I think what we miss in this whole idea of like a seat at the table Ooh. is a voice at the table. And really being able to actively listen to people that have been traumatized. Man. Yes. That have this like deep-seated anger and upset and really sadness, right? Because yeah. isn't it all just grief in some form or another? Absolutely. Like, I missed I out on that. this. I could definitely I didn't that. have that. You know, and like I read a quote recently that grief puts us in a position to not even know who we are. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. And yeah. You could definitely get lost in it. Because like I, to my understanding, like anger, for instance, being a secondary emotion. So I could definitely see grief being the primary emotion for yeah, sure, sadness. for sure. And then the response to that is anger. And then you begin to lose yourself in that anger. You know what I mean? And then sometimes people even begin to identify who they're becoming with this mask as their actual identity. And now they feel like this is who I am. This is who I got to be. This is what I need to uphold. And that's uh, to your point. I think you can really lose yourself like that. Like I've not seen it countless times, unfortunately. Well, it's almost like its own living being inside you. And so if you're missing your father because he's incarcerated mm. and you're in preschool yeah. and oh, suddenly man. they're telling you you're suspended because you're acting out about this thing that you're sad about. Yes. Oh man, you can't have emotions. You can't, and 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 you're taught this when going taking that little when you go then visit your father. Yeah. And how we desensitize and dehumanize even the process to just go visit, then you just start to realize, okay, I can't have any feelings. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're talking about therapy. I'm I'm in the therapist with what I call yoga therapist. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize I can't even do this. What do they call it? Shavasana when you lay down. Bro, I can't do that. It's taken me like two years to be okay to be in a room, and it's a private session. Like, mm. and I, I had to like have walls, like literally those little that they do building blocks with, just as like, is something going to happen here? Right. And that's the trauma that the thing that I learned. There's a, a, another shout out here we want to give is Dr. John Iguabike, who talks about the li he has a listening institute, and he says, you know, you were just saying this about the first thing, the best thing you can ever do is just stop and listen to what's inside you. Who are you in this moment? Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. We don't spend enough time. Sometimes our privilege of having cell phones, TVs, everything, is that it gives us an opportunity to avoid. You know, it used to be when we were growing up, it was drugs, alcohol, whatever. But now it's just everywhere that right. I'm starting to wonder, like, wait a minute. If, we, if we're not even slowing down, how is it that then, how is it that an elephant can put down his massive paw on the ground? put his trunk down, send a message, and three miles away, the family can hear. Mm. What are we doing, people? Mm. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, because I want to give a little description of Shavasana so people understand what Thank a vulnerable you. position it's, it is. You're laying on your back, generally with your arms either out wide or <laughs> at your side, full chest, face, neck exposed to the world with your eyes closed. Yeah. I mean. And then what happens after that? <laughs> exactly. So that's the question. Then, right? So if you've thank grown you. up being having to defend yourself, yeah, thank you. 
having to defend yourself. Just thinking about it made me uncomfortable. Like, what the <laughs> hell? Went? Like, damn. Facts. <laughs> worrying about who's in the room. Right. Yes. Worrying about, you know, always wanting to see all sides of a room. Yes. And where the exit is. Yes. And you're laying on the floor. Yes. With just a mat. And you've got your arms wide open and opening up your chest. Yeah, I mean, that's him. like, that's, you got to be able to open your heart to do that, right? Yes. That's, heavy. that's a lot of trust. That's heavy. I don't care if one person's in the room. I, I have a hard time doing it by myself. Exactly. Yeah, that's heavy. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about, especially like Yoga Prison Project, right? Right. I mean, which I mean, is a thing. Yeah, definitely. They're, they're t- teaching men and women to do this inside. It's incredible. That is a lot of trust. A lot of trust. And it probably takes a lot of them a long time to get there. I can't, I still can't do yoga. <laughs> yeah, not yet. It, 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 yoga I was married to a yoga difficult. instructor. I still can't do yoga. <laughs> I definitely could do it. I, I mean, I, I didn't try, and a lot of my peoples did. I mean, I'm open to it, but never, never really got into <laughs> it, though. But, um, man, whole lot of gems being dropped, whole lot of jewels being dropped. And I want to further pick your brain okay. for sure. Because okay. I know one thing that you're great at doing is having those tough conversations. You know mm. what I mean? Like like prime example, um, like one of the works you do, like educators of color and things like that, navigating whiteness in areas like Marin and things yeah. like that. You, 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 in my opinion, I've seen you in action, are a master at having these very difficult dialogues, but ultimately with the intention of finding common ground, finding mm. solutions, actually getting things done to see a better tomorrow, if we will, right? So what I would like to know uh, what are some key strategies for addressing like systemic racism within the educational institutions? And do you feel like it's the same approach for the criminal justice system? Mm. Wow, that's such a great question. Oh, I'm going to hit you with something heavy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the answer obviously is yes. And can I geek out a little bit? Please. Please. Okay. <laughs> so if I got to explain more, I mean, I'm going to let you translate and all that, right? <laughs> so I've been studying some quantum physics piece. Oh, it's going to get real. Right. So have you heard this term entanglement theory? Mm-hmm. Sounds So familiar. this entanglement theory. We're set, not talking Jada, Jada, uh, enta- not that entanglement. We're not, we're not talking okay. about that. Gotcha. Not, not Jada's entanglement. <laughs> <laughs> Although there might have been some entanglement of what I'm about to talk about with the particles. Okay, okay. So the particles are like these small, small things. They're smaller than atoms and all that, right? And smaller than molecules. Nobody can see it, right? But scientists have said, wait a minute, there's this phenomenon that happens that if I cut a particle in half and I put it in New York and I put the other one in San Francisco and then you make this particle in New York move a certain way, the one in San Francisco will do exactly the same thing. They're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, how how does that happen? They cannot explain this, right? The beautiful thing is our ancestors and indigenous knowledge has been saying we are all connected. We are all this humanity. We all come, as Dolores Huerta says, we're all a human race. Mm. So you know what? Let's go back to Africa and go thank everybody that got us to where we are here, right? So I use that as a, a first piece about commonality, understanding that we are actually all humans. And what I learned is this. It requires, no, the two forces that are the strongest is fear, you know, you walk down the street, you just mug somebody, what are they going to do? they going to mug you back. You walk down that same street, you smile at somebody, what are they going to do? They're going to smile back. That's those particles in action because we're human beings trying to connect. The thing is that fear and hate require no discipline because it's by any means necessary. That thing called love and hope particles, that requires discipline. So what I've learned in in holding these spaces, and especially as we talk about educators of color and then in the criminal justice system, is is going to sound very alchemist-like, where you are moving that energy in the room. And so when we've been together facilitating, and we'll sometimes talk about like, oh, we see this is what's going on over there, and we see what's going on over there. How do we move that energy to come together and connect? How do we find those commonalities? And I think the challenge is, is that the immediate piece that people want to do is to start showing how different they are Hmm. because there's a desire to say, wait, I'm somebody. Hmm. What I'm trying to help people see is, yes, you are somebody because we are part of everybody. Oh, man. And that's what I think we need to do in the criminal justice system like when we do in these facilitations of how do you navigate whiteness in Marin is, yes, does white supremacy exist? Absolutely. 
that doesn't mean that I use that language to every single person that I walk to because I know they're going to be scared of me. Right. They're, they're intimidated by me just by me showing up, you know. And so in that space, it's helping people like, oh, we're connected and moving that energy together. And that is what we've seen we could do in education, but you could do in the criminal justice system. Going back to it's not why did you do what you do, but connect like what's your story? How did you get here? That's heavy. That's amazing. <laughs> that is heavy, for real. But I, I definitely love that idea as far as, like, moving the energy and coming together kind of thing. Because in my opinion, I think that's one of the things that's needed. I think a lot of time it's real easy to get caught up on the surface, right? And mm. me personally, I feel like literally everything, and I mean this in the most literal sense possible, I feel like everything is deeper than the surface. Everything is a matter of energy, you know, and how that's getting emanated, if we will. Like, I feel like that understanding is necessity yes. when wanting to see certain results, especially when dealing with people. Because I'm a firm believer that we all connected through energy as well. Yes. So, like, I, I say this all the time as well. Like, energy can't be fake because it's felt. So when you're able to... To, to understand, not necessarily control that energy, but understand that energy, I think that could lead you towards results. So, like, that that was some real game right there for the show. <laughs> Appreciate that. Driving that on us like that, for real. No, amazing. I mean, I don't need to interpret that. It, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> well, you know. It goes back to the community conversation. Yes. So, allow people to be themselves, but within the community. Well, we'll use. can I use this example that, uh, E, you and I know Jameo Brown, right? This phenomenal... <laughs> phenomenal drummer right here's what i learned from him is that when you're drumming you're learning to how to listen which is what dr john nigwebiki talks about but you're learning how to listen to what the other person is doing and while you're holding your foundation of what you're doing that balance that act is meaning that connection of who you are and i asked him the other day we were drumming it and just the other day i said Wait a minute. When we're drumming sometimes, I don't know. Am I leading you somewhere or am I following you? I don't even know what's going on sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm always following because I'm always listening. And I thought, that's a leader. And mm -hmm. so how do we think of back to our criminal justice system, our educational system, where our leadership starts to think like, it's not about me. It's about how do I navigate to what's already there of what, where people are coming from so you can meet them where they're at. That's the big piece that we need to figure out how to do. Definitely. Well, and I, talking about that exact phrase, meet people where they are, mm -hmm. I mean, most of the most successful organizations are able to do that. Yes. Because they, they, they ask. Yes. And they listen. You know, I, when I was on the streets in San Francisco, there was an organization that I thought they were just out there giving out socks and hygiene kits. <laughs> right? What they were trying to do is convince young drug addicts and homeless kids to go to coffee with them so they could chat. And help them with the other things. What are yes. your dreams? Yes. What's really wow. going on with you? And so the socks, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, the hygiene kit, well, all it was was an attraction, right? Because wow. they were meeting us where we were. Yes. So they get us into that coffee shop and say, hey, what's really going on with you? How'd you end up here? You're 24 years old. What are you doing on the street? You know? And that, it was successful. The guy that ran that organization and I are still friends to this day. That's and nice. I was his client 26 years ago. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, th th that exact phrase truly works. If you're able to really identify where people are at mm -hmm. and meet them there, not make them come to you, you're bringing all of what you have to the table. And I say this to even family that, that don't want to communicate. I'm like, if you don't bring anything, we can't meet. Yeah. If you even tell me just one little thing, I can come to you. Yes. You know, so yes. and that's that's one of the most important things, along with then listening when you sit down with them, you know, so I think all of this really like top to bottom when we talk about, you know, the term at risk youth, Ooh. you know, <laughs> all youth are at risk, depending on their household. That facts, part. facts. Right? That part. <laughs> Let me yeah. break that down for you. Yeah, please do. I mean, th there was just a kid that the, the daughter of uh, of the founder of Slack. Mm that ran away from home Man. in Bolinas, California. Whoa. To San Francisco, ran off with some street kid, you know? Wow. This is a billionaire's daughter. Right. Wow. Who is very troubled for whatever reason. Mm. Don't judge the parents. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, but mm -hmm. it, this is, money does not save you. No. Right. No, no you can hide it, 
And that's the challenge. Yeah. That's the th- challenge that financial privilege creates for you. And the thing that that's why I wanted to break this down. I mean, the E3 video that, that we, we, we do oftentimes talks about in risk students, at risk students and future at risk students. Your in-risk students are your bottom third who are just already going out, right? You already know, and they're, they're, you're heading them, and they're literally going to the prison. Your at-risk students are the ones where a lot of nonprofits try to create money and you know have money to support them in all those pieces. Your future at-risk students are future at-risk because while they may be going to college, first of all, only 60% of the people who go to college graduate from college. And according to the research, only 25% of those who graduate from college are excellently prepared for the workforce. Mm -hmm. So you need to ask two questions. First of all, why are we continuing to train people only for the workforce and not to be their better self? That part. And then the second part is we want to make sure we ask ourselves that we want to uh, find out why are we just creating the space that it's not just one problem, but it's everybody's problem and it's a human problem. And that's the piece when we start looking at the who's really at risk. We're all at risk from this right now in where we are, which is why I always like to say to your point about what happened uh, with your friend 26 years ago, the most equitable thing we can do is slow down. Mm. Nah, that's real. That's real. And this has been an absolute honor and pleasure, man. So serious. As you know, Kev, we could definitely go on and on. <laughs> I think? would love to sit and pick your brain forever. And I will. I'm going to hold myself to that and hold you to that as well. But before we go, it's definitely uh, one question that we got to ask all our guests before we get up out of here, man. And this is somewhat of a, of a loaded question because I know it's a bunch of things that can come to mind. But... If you could change one thing in our current system, only one, what would it be and why? Yeah. So I thought about that for sure. And and I think, you know, we're going to loop back to what I had shared in the beginning. I think we need to focus at the end of the day, how do we actually humanize our criminal justice systems, not as criminals, but human beings who made an error in judgment. Mm. And if we could do that as our approach, then all of our other pieces of micro moments would enable us in micro moments start to pause and listen, would start to look at restorative practices as the way to, to, to solve these issues. I think that's the piece. If we could do that in the criminal justice system, which I'm going to make the argument, starts at preschool. Straight up. The earlier the better, for sure. And I think that definitely highlights, you know, it's not this one-size-fit-all approach, no. for sure. I think it definitely is circumstantial, and that's one of the things, in my opinion, that leads towards, like, disproportionate sentencing and things of that nature because, like, these mandatory minimums and then Ooh. just the overall discretion that comes from certain judges and DAs and things like that. You know what I mean? So I definitely agree with that wholeheartedly. So thank you for sharing that, for sure. Yep. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on. This has been a tremendous conversation, and, you know, we do need to—, to to wrap, but I, I, this is just, we need to talk more about what's happening to especially our younger youth when they get into school. And I think this is a great way to start. Absolutely, absolutely. So, again, one thing I say all the time, too, and I definitely got to do this because this is what we do on the Last Mile Radio, man. We give flowers. So I definitely got to give you your flowers. And where that <laughs> comes from, you know what I mean? A lot of times people get the credit, people get the acknowledgement, and quite literally the flowers after, unfortunately, they dead and gone and they get them on the grave. So definitely mm. want to give you your flowers for all that you do, all that you continue to do, man, because you have a hell of a journey. It's so much that could be taken away from your story. And, again, just the work that you do, man, you are on the front lines actively involved in so much making an impact so definitely got to give your flowers man so serious much appreciated much appreciated and always as you know e wherever you go we're here to support you likewise man and thank you it's highly appreciated but you just heard this powerful discussion with me and my dog kevin mccracken and the one and only dr juan carlos right here on the last mile radio on sirius xm we'll be back shortly so stay tuned